Ladies and gents, welcome back to another Engineers podcast. Today I'm joined by Ben Golden, who is founder and CEO of a company called Plumery. And their platform really helps banks deliver incredible customer experiences. Now, in today's world, uh, everyone or a lot of people are using a neo bank or a digital bank of some sort. So this is really understanding the brains behind delivering a really good customer experience and the engineering efforts that it really takes to deliver something like this. So we're really lucky that we've got Ben come to speak to us about some of his experience and what he's building at Plumery. Ben, nice to meet you. Likewise. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Elliot. Happy to share more. You've got your nice little plumery uh, sheet in the background. Indeed, that's intentional. Spot on branding. <laughs> Spot on branding. Ben, do you want to give the audience some visibility on your background, your experience and career to date, if you like, and who plumery are and what they're building? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm CEO and founder of uh, Plumero right now. Uh, in general, I've spent a bit more than 20 years building uh, product and technology for financial services. Started my career pretty early, straight into banking. Uh, prior to starting Plumery, I was a CTPO at uh, Mambu. And before that, uh, I was working for another uh, banking company as a chief architect. Uh, yeah, and right now, right now we're building uh, Plumery, which is a customer experience platform uh, for banks, essentially an operating system for front-end channels in, a, in, 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 in the different worlds. We sit on top of legacy and modern core banking infrastructure, so we work with uh, core banking systems like Mambu, Toom, uh, Saskada, Top Machine, and similar ones, uh, but we also work with traditional legacy uh, core banking infrastructure, such as Finastra, Oracle, FlexQ, Temenos, uh, as well as uh, bespoke systems. And we power up mobile and web applications uh, for banks, providing uh, both delightful experience out of the box, but also what's more important, flexibility to adjust it to the needs of individual banks. Okay. Really understanding that product is uh, really quite similar to a white label service that's rolled out and then bespoke maybe to different banking products? Yeah, it's uh, it's a little bit similar in, in, in a way what problem we solve, but we do it differently. We we employ an approach that, that is called headless, which actually enables banks to build uh, or, or modify the actual user experience to their needs without any limitations, right? So they have they, they can leverage full flexibility to do that in their own ways. Uh, and in addition to that, the reason why I said we are an operating system is because we really follow that approach that like any operating system that has uh, applications that come out of the box and can be ready used, and at the same time give superior developer experience to build additional capability that is not available. Uh, right, And that's, that's, that's the approach we follow as well. Right, uh, we enable banks both to tailor uh, the experience of functionality we provide out of the box, but, uh, as well as enable them to build new digital journeys alongside ours, leveraging our architecture. I, I really think the customer experience and digital experience, especially in banking and fintechs, um, maybe I'm biased because I'm a user of these platforms day to day, but I think that they really changed the game and they really helped other companies think about how a customer wants to interact, specifically with their mobile app, the, the KYC, the UX, the ease of use. And I think what is not necessarily undervalued, but there's so much importance on developer experience, which is going to be one of our takeaways today help us understand what developer experience means to Plumery and why. Right. So I think for us, developer experience has two angles. One angle is internal. The other one is external, right? So from the external angle perspective, we want to make sure banks can easily develop new 
digital journeys uh, without spending time on figuring out architecture and integrities from scratch, uh, without fig- uh, spending time figuring out how to build CI CD pipelines and, and things that uh, enables their developers work faster and really focus on what matters most. Uh, so that's the external angle. The internal angle is a little bit broader than that. Uh, internally for us, it's important to make sure uh, developers have well, productive environment, a holistically productive environment they can work in, right? Uh, it starts obviously with some tools and technologies that we that we pick and, and, and internal development platforms that we build, but also goes beyond that uh, when we start thinking about way of working and uh, preventing interruptions and making sure developer, developers can really have uh, quality time to focus on, uh, on what they build. Right, so we 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 put a lot of uh, effort in thinking how to improve that every day. Yeah. What impact do you think good developer experience has on engineering and product teams? Well, I think it's uh, it's fundamental. If if developer experience is not in focus, right? If developer experience is clunky and frustrating, if people need if, if, if in order to achieve something, you depend on many different uh, roles and people in the organization. If, uh, if your tools are not properly integrated and you have to do a lot of manual work, if you are constantly interrupted by managers and other people who ask how things are going and how far you are and when you're going to finish your job, if you have to participate in a whole bunch of meetings, of course, you can't achieve much, right? Uh, and each of these things individually might seem small, but when you combine them together, all these small frustrations and interruptions and things like that, uh, it has a very significant impact on the on the outcome. Yeah, both in terms of quality, but also in terms of actual time spent uh, on doing things, as well as general, uh, let's say, creativity and, and appetite for doing things and and and, and innovating. Uh, yeah. I've got a podcast on this in a few weeks and it's centered around digital accessibility. And there's, there's a bit of crossover here with developer experience and digital accessibility. And it's really about creating a seamless pathway for people to use products or tools that you've built. And it almost feels as if it's subconscious as well. You talk about, you know, manual tasks, but it's really removing any barriers to using a tool, product, platform, whatever it might be. I like thinking of it that way. Yeah, hundred percent. And again, just to emphasize, there's one thing which is just tools and technology, but equally important thing that is often being uh, completely underestimated is the impact of interruptions, uh, right? And generally the uh, the idea of flow, right, and how important it is, especially for creative work, which is software engineering, right? As much as it is science, it's actually probably a bit more art and craft than than science. Uh, and and for this kind of work, you have to have uh, no interrupt, uh, interruptions. Uh, you have to be able to go into a flow. You have to be able to have uh, long chunks of uh, non-interrupted work where you can actually focus and uh, you know uh, some time ago people were measuring productivity of engineers in lines of code i think that's the worst thing that can can happen right uh code is the sort of a certain representation of thinking but before you write code thinking needs to happen and for thinking to happen you have to have a non-interrupted chunk of time right yeah. so that this, this these aspects are extremely important for good outcomes. Yeah, I've spoken about it on the pod as well previously. I'd be keen to know what your thoughts are around, what are your thoughts around measuring productivity and metrics? (laughs) Uh, Well, see, I guess it depends a little bit on the stage of the company and the amount of people you have, right? Because when you have relatively small team, uh, you don't necessarily have to create a bureaucratic process with uh, actual measurements. Uh, any engineering manager or, or CTO 
have a proper instinct on, on, on what's what's working, what's not working. Because all the all the metrics essentially they are super contextual, yeah. right? You cannot just easily uh, quantify a performance of engineering like you cannot quantify performance of art as well, right? Sure. Uh, in numbers without contextualizing it and augmenting these numbers with intuition and, and yeah. understanding of individual people and their s- specifics, right? Uh, uh, s- strengths and weaknesses and things like that. So I guess at this point in time, we are managing it without really quantifying it explicitly. But obviously, previously we did uh, we did have different measures and uh, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, DORA metrics uh, with, with, with lead time and other metrics, uh, other uh, key four metrics, uh, and that's what we that's what we did prior prior to Krumri in uh, in Mambo. Okay, would you be able to explain Dora metrics and any other metrics? There's a reason why I'm asking this question because I'm really keen to understand. A future question I want to ask is: if you had to build a DevX playbook and maybe roll that out to another business, what would that look like? And I feel like metrics is probably going to be quite key to that. Yeah, yeah, metrics is definitely important. So let me see if I can remember all of them uh, off the top of my mind. So uh, lead time to change is one uh, very important metric is how how long it takes really from the idea entering the backlog to, to the idea ending up in production. Yeah, That's one of the key ones, right? And it helps understand whether you have any handovers in the process that are not necessarily necessary, uh, what are the weights uh, that are happening along the process. Um, what was the other one? Uh, mean time between incidents, right? So how often your software actually crashes that helps understand more on the quality. It doesn't tell by itself. There's no root cause there, right? So it's not like you can take that metric and know exactly how to, how to fix the problem. Uh, a lot of work needs to be done to diagnose it further and understand what's not working, but that's another one. Uh, another th- thought that I've had is how can a company be really intentional with their metrics? Because contextualization is really important, like you said, and different business sizes, different team sizes. How can you be really intentional with some of your metrics? Well, I think keeping them simple, uh, that's what I liked about Dora, by the way, keeping them simple uh, to like up to five different metrics that are abstract enough, but also outcome oriented, right? So these metrics are not oriented towards measuring individual performance of individual people, right? These metrics are oriented towards measuring the outcome. Uh, Then you can standardize more or less the, the... the process, how you collect these metrics, uh, how you interpret these metrics, and then it's it's a job of individual manager uh, to contextualize it and uh, and decide what needs to be done, right? And try to actually diagnose potential issues that are leading to to results that are not necessarily uh, satis- uh, satisfying. Okay, the, there is a point that I know that we wanted to emphasize around managers versus makers would you be able to go into a little bit more detail and shed some light on that yeah absolutely no i i'm, I'm a huge fan of this uh, concept uh i do not remember anymore who who was the one who actually coined that and, and described it uh, uh, initially but the idea is that uh makers and managers fundamentally work on different uh schedules right uh, managers are very much used to uh, constant interruptions, um, uh, spending all days in meetings, uh, right? A completely different type of work where the entire agenda is very fragmented. However, makers, uh, they actually need to go into flow. They need to have a long chunks of, uh, of work. And the idea is to have that explicitly defined in the organization. Are you on the manager's schedule or are you on the maker's schedule? If you're on the maker's schedule, you have to have no meetings days, for instance, right? When you need to have in your calendar pre-agreed long chunks of time where nobody can interrupt you and it is not expected that you're going to immediately react to 
uh, questions and responses. And there are other more, more things that needs to be done for this to work. For instance, uh, how to deal with uh, customer requests and production incidents, right? Where you need a maker on one hand to be able to respond quite fast on SLAs. So one of the one of the approaches that worked for us uh, so far, both in Plumery and, and and in other companies, is to have people who are uh, like an interruption engineers, you know, uh, there are different titles uh, to use. Some companies call them guardians, other call them, call them uh, interruption engineers. These are people that are specifically uh, designated to react to interruption, interruptions uh, during the day and they work on rotation, right? So every engineer from a team gets to be an interruption engineer uh, at some point in time, right? Because obviously you don't want to have a full-time interruption engineer because that interruption engineer uh, needs to get experience uh, and actually write code in order to be able to properly resolve uh, incidents and issues. So that's basically a couple of approaches that we that we employ and I employed throughout my career. There's some good learnings. It really is an art, isn't it? Like you said. Yeah, exactly. Talk to us about more of your experience, really, that you learned to Mambu, and back base because no doubt this is powered plumery, which I want to touch on a bit more, but talk to us about some really big learnings, especially around developer experience, uh, Mambu and back base. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess during, during, during my back base time, uh, it wasn't yet well established to talk about, uh, developer experience, right? So. I can I can share much. I can share pains where a lot of things were still done manually, and uh, it was a bit of a struggle to find uh, people who we typically call DevOps these days. Although I'm not necessarily uh, in favor of that name, but still people who understand well uh, things beyond writing uh, business logic, right, or let's say application code, but also people who can wire together pipelines and automate uh, continuous integrations, continuous delivery cycles, stuff like that. So we had to do it uh, manually and we, we, had to, we had to learn a lot. These days, of course, it's much easier, right? And already during, during Mambo times, it was much easier because there are tools available and technology available. What was important is, of course, to uh, approach developer experience pretty much like a product, especially when it comes to internal platforms, right? And internal tools. When you approach it like a product, you treat uh, internal engineers in the organization as your customers. And when you treat them as a customers, you do similar things to what you do to your actual external customers. You do discovery conversations. You try to understand uh, where are the biggest pains, um, you try to understand how their day-to-day -day job looks like and where you could possibly improve it without even asking them what's the proper solution, right? Because that's that's how product should work. You are not coming to a customer asking, hey, tell me what solution to build and I'm going to build it, right? You are, you are spending time talking about problems much more, right? And, and, and frustrations and needs. So when you approach internal platforms and developer experience that way, uh, you tend to build better products for developers. And obviously, you th with that, you impact the overall outcome uh, better, uh, right? Because sometimes when you let, uh, let's say, hardcore developers build internal developer tools and platforms, they do it based on their own understanding what's good and based on their own understanding what is the biggest pain to solve today. Or maybe not necessarily what's, what is the what is the most important pain to solve, but rather uh, what motivates me the most today, right? Do I want to play with that tool or this tool? Uh, and that's normal, that's okay, but there has to be someone who actually steers this a little bit more towards solving real real problems for the rest, uh, for the rest of the teams. And that's important. And once again, technology is one aspect. There has to be someone, or it needs to be a DNA of a company, really, to look at developer experience holistically. Right? Preventing unnecessary meetings, preventing unnecessary interruptions, making sure people can focus on their job. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think the mindset of really treating colleagues, products, dev people internally as stakeholders and really understanding their problems is key to getting DevX right. Help us understand some of those learnings and how that's really powered your mission at Plumery and, and what you want to take from that and and do inside of Plumery. Well, uh, internally, obviously, we, we started to implement most of the things from, from day zero, uh, yeah. right? Because we, we firmly believe in, uh, in benefits of doing so. Uh, except metrics that I mentioned already before. That's something that uh, yeah. that needs to come uh, along. Uh, but also our ultimate goal is to bring some of these practices and uh, some of these approaches to our customers as well, right? Because uh, one of our principles, we say digital innovation in banking is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And because it's a marathon, uh, banks should be enabled really to continuously improve what's been delivered already, uh, right? And that requires certain engineering practices that require certain engineering tools and internal platforms. And that's also one of our important focuses because we, we want to solve a problem of, of digital experience holistically, not just, hey, we're going to come, help you build your first mobile web app, and that's it. No, we, we want to make sure our platform can support uh, our customers for many years to come and, and enable them really to operate like a successful digital business. Yeah. What do you think banks' biggest digital challenges are of today and are of tomorrow? Right. Great question. Let me think. So ch challenges generally bank banks are facing are, uh, well, there are many. Of course, uh, some some of the most fundamental ones. It's very difficult to innovate in banks or basically uh, keep up with the technological trends and keep up with uh, expectations of uh, end customers for many reasons. Some re some banks are struggling to attract the right talent. Other banks have a lot of bureaucratic processes internally, and it's just difficult to uh, procure or build. Uh, state-of-art uh, technology. Uh, others are, are, are still struggling, if it's the right word, with maintaining existing legacy systems, which takes up all of their capacity and most of their uh, budget. So there's literally just no time uh, to innovate and build new things since you have to maintain existing ones and make sure they're still compliant, reliable, secure. Right, so these are key challenges, I would, I would say, of today. Um, these are similar challenges that will remain, to be honest, with traditional banks. These challenges will not go away. Um, there are vendors like ourselves who are trying to simplify a journey of adopting new technology for banks, um, removing potentially dependency on uh, the most skilled, top-notch uh, specialists and experts in the market and enable banks to hire who is available and who is ready to come and work for banks and still achieve uh, uh, meaningful uh, results, uh, right? But um, fundamentally, compliance burden is not going away. Banks are heavily regulated. Uh, regulators are even increasing the burden. I haven't heard anything about decreasing the burden just yet. Uh, there's more stuff to be done. There's more stuff to get yourself compliant every year. Uh, typical decent sized bank would have hundreds of systems uh, already in place that needs to be maintained, that needs to be continuously supported and operated. That requires a lot of capacity, that requires a lot of money and time, right? And uh, replacing these systems can be done easily, uh, right? I'm not even talking about mainframes that are. Uh, Yes, that are operating COBOL code that was written 30, 40 years ago. And people who wrote it, well, unfortunately, some of them already uh, not around anymore. Uh, others are retired and it's kind of difficult to maintain that code. It still works, right? And replacing it will cost much more than keeping it, keeping it working and potentially building 
let's say new systems around and still keeping some of some parts of the architecture within these mainframes. But these are these are the challenges, you know. And uh, for modern companies, it's sometimes hard to understand actually what is the what is the internal uh, context and environment banks operate in, right? We we often we often like to blame banks, right, for their slowness, for uh, for their uh, let's say subpar experience and the subpar service. Uh, there's so much complexity that banks have to deal with day to day, and so much um, again, as I said, so much compliance and other kind of uh, burden that they need to take care of. Uh, that yeah, I can I can understand why uh, why there's no time really to shift the focus completely towards uh, building innovative solutions for their customers. And that's really it. And I think that's where I think you've got an opportunity to really plug a good gap in the market. Um, I think legacy technology, legacy processes, bureaucracy on top of legislation, regulation. I hear you. I've spoken to many people on the podcast before. That is the crux of the problem. Um, yeah. I think I think you've got a really good gap in the market to help banks move faster, innovate on some of that. I love your little strap line, rapid innovation. I agree. Yeah, that's the idea. That's um, the idea. Ultimately, this is fairly subjective, but what do you think makes a good developer experience? Well, I, I shouldn't feel regular frustrations during my day-to-day -day work, right? Uh, that's what's important. And, you know, there's this concept of autonomy and it's uh, this concept of autonomy is a little bit broad, right? It means different things to different people. But when it comes to developer experience, autonomy is making sure you can complete your work without reliance on anyone else. Uh, and without any frustrations that are repeatable, that are coming with every task, you feel the same frustrations again and again, right? Or I'm constantly being interrupted, or this tool here just doesn't work, and I just can't commit my code, or I can't release my code easily as many times as I need during the day, right? So autonomy and lack of frustrations, being able to go into flow, that these are key things that drive uh, superior developer experience. Okay. I love that answer. I love that answer. Talk to us a little bit about 2024 and Plumery before we wrap up and what an audience can expect. Right. So this year will be for us a lot about uh, growing, and bringing in customers and bringing our platform to the hands of uh, customers globally, so that's uh, that's that's very much our focus. Uh, we obviously continue developing our platform. We add capabilities pretty much every week. Um, we just released our first internal pilot of uh, generative AI assistant for um, for users really to leverage their data uh, combined with generative AI to get advisors to get uh, retrospective analysis of their spendings and uh, um, what's uh, what to do with their money, uh, right? So these are kind of things that that to be expected uh, to be expected from us. We're gonna see how we're gonna embed more generative AI into different capabilities uh, of our platform. We will also expand our ecosystem and integrate with more partners to bring even more value and simplify essentially the journey of working with some of the innovative technologies for banks, because they will be able to acquire that uh, as part of a platform instead of integrating that individually. Okay. And this has really been your experience, as in what I mean by the experience is in, you've been in top tier businesses delivering really good financial products and experiences for customers. I can really feel the mission. I think you guys have got a massive future for people listening. Keep an eye on Plumery. We're going to talk about careers, where you're hiring, because this is a really great page and a great forum to be able to do that. But I wish you guys every success. 
I know with you at the tier, you'll be absolutely flying. You will do a great job. I'm a hundred percent sure of that. Do you want to talk to us about where you're going to be building the business and people that you need to bring into the business to help you grow and scale? Sure. So I guess in the next uh, eight to 12 months, there will be a lot of focus on go to market, market organization, right? Commercial organization, which is sales, marketing, business development. Uh, we have very strong engineering team right now, and we feel that we can, we can achieve a lot with that team already now. Uh, towards the second half of the year, we'll see if we'll start uh, bringing in more engineers and expand our, our, our tech team. Uh, obviously, across different roles, staff engineers, principal engineers, senior engineers. For people listening, seniors, staffs, principals, keep an eye on Plumery. Keep an eye on Plumery. If you're interested in rapid innovation in the fintech space, these guys and girls should be your go-to. I'll, I'll actually Appreciate link it. the Couriers site underneath so people can keep a track on you guys. I want to say a massive thanks, Ben, for coming to talk to us about all things DevX. You are Mr. DevX, or one of them. <laughs> um, so a big thank you. And for everyone listening, keep track on these guys. No doubt you're going to see them pop up again and again and again. Like I said, a big thank you. Thank, thanks as well, Elliot. Appreciate it. Brilliant. Thank you. No worries at all for everyone listening. The likes, shares, subscribes, subscribe to Plumery. This is all massively appreciated um, to keeping this community going. So a big thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching this episode. Uh, massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us. If you want to find out more about us and what we're doing, please check us out on social media. What we're trying to do at Engineers is build a community to drive knowledge sharing and experiences. On Twitter, we can be found at engineers.io. It's no underscore. We've also got a website, which is engineers.io. These links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks, guys.